coming to these meetings for a long time, and I um, genuinely regard it as the highest quality meeting in the field. It is not trivial to get here from northern Scotland in January, uh, but it's a pleasure to be here among you again. And one of the things about my talk today is that none of the work I'll show you has been published, so I hope that will be of interest. We have new work on ultra tetragonal lead titanate, we have new work on domain wall conduction, and we have, I think, six new, completely new feral echoes. So we'll show you a little bit of everything. And uh, I hope you'll find at least one or two of these things of interest. Um, I want to start with uh, an update on this study uh, on super tetragonal uh, lead titanate. And uh, although somebody kindly referred to this uh, this morning as from my group, it's not from my group at all. This is work that was done uh, headed by John Chen, and he is uh, a young professor and dean at the University of Science and Technology in Beijing. That is a relatively new university, and the work after I presented initial results at this meeting last year was published in Science. They're very excited about that because it was the first paper from that university in science. And if you do that in China, everybody gets a big reward, including the grad students. So uh, the idea, just for those of you who didn't follow the work here last year or in science, is um, Zhang Chen had been trying for some time to um, to put lead titanate on, directly on uh, lead oxide. And for most of us who are not real material scientists, that's an unreasonable thing to try, because the lattice mismatch is huge. And so I would guess if we tried to do that, it would just peel off. It didn't peel off. It made a beautiful epitaxial structure, which shown on the upper left. And the, if I can be anthropomorphic about it a little bit, note that that's not a straight plane. And the lead ions don't know which side they should be going. I think without doing any math, that's how I look at the problem. So it stays together, but it produces an extremely large C over A ratio. And uh, the resulting polarization is 238 microcoulombs per centimeter squared which is nearly twice that on any other material. So we did some more work on these materials this year and uh, want to follow this up. This was a comparison with C over A ratios obtained and in comparison with lead titanate nanowires or bulk lead titanate or a couple of other materials. So these are impressive numbers and one of the things that we wish to do this year was to get some pretty AFM pictures of domains. We had some which showed the polarization out of plane and the size of the domains, but they weren't particularly beautiful. Now one of the things I want to emphasize is that the hysteresis loops are somewhat flattened out. We've explained that elsewhere. And the other thing that's important is that on the right, upper right, you will see what happens to the Curie temperature. It's enormously increased. And that's an important self-consistency because about 1970 or so, uh, Stu Kurtz and others at Bell Labs uh, wrote a little paper in FizzRev which explained that if the polarization gets very large in the perovskite, the Curie temperature must also get large by a particular amount, and this satisfies their relationship. So that was by uh, Stu Kurtz and James, and, and uh, it's well known, but it's very old. So it's all consistent, and the question is, um, what do these domains look like? So, 
We've done some work recently with the Russians uh, on dead layer thickness and shapes of hysteresis curves in these materials. And I'm going to skip that here for time. But what I want to show you is a picture of some hysteresis curves in what um, Sasha Dugans have called uh, profiles. And so we, one of the things we're interested in is how flat or how sharp the tip of the fertile electricity is. And the new work by Pogornik and the others in Moscow uh, calculates that and shows that the primary uh, parameter involved in that tip shape is actually the amount of charge injection between the electrode interface and, and the fertile now, this is the new AFM work. This was done by a young lecturer in Marty Gregg's group in Belfast at Queen's University. And uh, um, he sent this to me with some questions. Um, the scale is shown in the bottom so that that, that bar is 87 nanometers. And this is one of the same ultra tetragonal lead titanate on PBO samples that uh, we had from the original batch. So what you'll see is these are planar domains and they're four-fold vertex structures of a typical size of order 50-60 nanometers. They're not out of plane. They're <coughs> in plane polarization. So it was a complete surprise. So my initial worry was, oh my goodness, maybe those original paper data that we published in science were only that a stable, maybe it converts. That's not true. So we went back and looked at all the original samples, some of which are now four years old. All the ones that have polarization out of plane still have polarization out of plane and it's still 230 or 40 microphones per centimeter squared. These were from the same batch. So all we conclude is that somehow, if we make a dozen of these, roughly half of them have the planar structures, and half of them have outer plane structures. And I personally don't mind admitting I don't have a clue why that's the case. It was not predicted. It doesn't seem to be part of the model, but the data are really pretty. I love these data. You notice that all the um, vortex, not vortex, vertex structures um, are about the same. So it's a very reproducible structure. So I toss this out as our newest results. They're not published anywhere. We frankly don't have a good idea of how to explain them. And uh, I hope that some of you people who are more clever than I will be able to help save this out. It's very reproducible. I have quite a few of these data. And um, um, Amit Kumar is the name of the young scientist who ran the data. And he's very reliable. And I, I just think the quality of these data uh, is really very high. So we should be able to do something with it, but I can't. So that's where we are with the ultra tetragonal lead titanate, namely uh, a big surprise. And I hope some of you will have ideas as to how you might be able to model these two uh, called different phases or nuclear structures. Now, the other work I'm going to talk about during the 25 minutes is also with Chinese. This is with Professor Chang. Chang was my assistant at Cambridge many years ago. And uh, he's now very near retirement. So it's a bit like having your children grow up. I don't mind having my students and postdocs become professors. But when they start retiring, I get very twitchy. <laughs> it doesn't seem right somehow. I'm here giving a talk, and these old students are about to go home. Uh, so last year, we published in Nature and Materials some very good domain-long conduction in bismuth ferro. 
And uh, we were not to, the first to see domain wall conduction. I think that credit goes to Seidel, Jan Seidel. And there have been some other very good studies by people like Lucas Eng and Dresden. Um, but our numbers were big. For example, the initial work uh, by Seidel's group in Sydney got about a picolin. We got 500 picolins. That's bigger. And in the work I'll show you today, we're getting a million. Not a micron, a million. Enormous conduction, reproducible. But we did that by switching from BFO to lithium niobate. Now, the real reason for switching to lithium niobate is this is China, and so the schedule is to make functional devices in a year. <coughs> lithium niobate is available in four inch wafers on silicon. You can put it right into production, you can make a thousand on a wafer. And it turns out to be much better than bismuth ferrite in two other ways. Lithium niobate is not ferroelastic. The phase transition is rhombohedral, rhombohedral. There's no crystal class change, so there's no ferroelasticity. That means when you drive the domain from one electrode to the other, it stays there when you turn the voltage off. There's no mechanical hysteretic restoring force. And the other thing that's probably equally important is lithium niobate domain walls are different from those in many other ferroelectrodes. They're not Ising-like, they're quite block-like, and they're big. They're not like magnetic domains, but they're, say, they're 10 atoms wide instead of 2, or they're 15 instead of 4. So we have a wider domain wall, which means we should get more current. And we have this non-ferroelastic behavior, which means when you switch it on, it stays on. And finally, we can buy four-inch wafers. In fact, the Koreans are now starting to sell six-inch lithium niobate wafers. So how do you do this then in China? You tell my former student, if it doesn't work, you retire this year. And if it does work, we're going to give you a factory. <coughs> well, what's a factory? It's not 400 people in white jackets. It's 10 engineers, somebody to do the bookkeeping, and a couple of million dollars worth of kit. Nevertheless, most of us would find that really hard to get from our government. So that's where we are now, and I'll try, try to show you that he has been successful. So if you look at the top picture, all the work that we've done is on the top surface. So we have two top electrodes that we labeled top electrode one and top electrode two. That's because it's easier to photograph and see what's going on. It's harder to make because it's harder to interdigitalize electrodes at very small spacing than it is to make them through a very thin film. But the pictures are quite pretty. So if you look on the left and you apply one kind of voltage, you can open the gap. So the, the figures you see, it says TE2 and TE1, top electrode 2 and top electrode 1, and you're actually seeing the domains. So as you increase or decrease the field, you open up the gap between the two domains. And you can watch it in real time come together. And the bottom curves then show the current versus voltage for different uh, polarities of voltage. So we think that lithium niobate will be the best material to uh, look at. And uh, this is just a reminder of what these things look like uh, from the top. This is a, a bismuth ferrite. And you can see at the top domain structures, and they're very complicated in bismuth ferrite. It's 190 degrees, 71 degrees, 
the number of domains and the kinds of domains involved in the switching are not simple. And you can see that as you apply the voltage, the bottom voltage is minus 15 volts. We've driven this blue domain all the way to the top electrode. Okay? So you can actually watch this. And the domain structures are not simple. Now that's the final advantage of lithium niobate over bismuth ferro. Only 180 degrees. <coughs> the domain structure is simple and non ferroelastic. More data. Again, top set of pictures show the left and right <coughs> electrodes, and the bottom picture shows what happens as you apply voltage. This happens to be plus or minus 16 volts. So these are not operating at 5 volts, which would be ideal, but they're not bad. This is still a device. <coughs> I don't know if you can read this, but this particular scale is microamps, so that's 10 microamps. So again, in comparison with the uh, work in Sydney by Seidel, this is a very good company. Now, um, I have to inject a little kind of a editorial. We sent this work to Nature Materials, where it got rejected. And the referee said, you're getting exactly the same current that Lucas Hang reported with the Nibe. So we replied, yes, but his was total current for 473 domains. Ours is current per domain. The editor wrote a very nice letter back which says, oh, I missed that part, but it's still the same idea. So it's not the same idea. One is a commercial device and the other is not a commercial. Currents uh, can be big, and the contrast, as you can see, if you take the very middle picture, that's plus and minus 16 volts, the contrast that you would measure by AFM or optical techniques is quite large. It goes from black to white. Um, this shows the dependence on voltage. This is 5 volt behavior, this is 8 volt behavior. This is the gap between the two electrodes, and it's of order 200 nanometers. So it's not a trivial thing to do to make surface electrodes 200 nanometers apart. So summarizing this part, first point is that lithium niobate is not ferroelastic, so it, uh, if you apply a voltage, uh, your switch wall stays switched. Secondly, the domain walls are block-like, and they're a few times thicker than in bismuth ferrite. And third, and most important for technology transfer, is lithium ion is already available in four inch by the wafer, and by this summer, six inches will be available. So it's commercial. So, uh, I'm going to skip this because it's a little too much stuff. So the last thing we have done just before I came here was to fabricate an array of lithium niobate. So these are just being made now, and they have not been tested. So we have no data on these at all. But it shows you the strategy in the way the Chinese are trying to leapfrog all the way from an initial paper to a technology transfer for a prototype device. Um, for those of you who don't work in this specialty at all, why do you want to do this? Well, as you make these chips smaller and smaller and smaller, one of the problems is the metal interconnects. Just how do you connect them up? And it could be either copper or aluminum interconnects. 